Hello everyone. For those who don't know me, I am Holly Trantham, TFD's creative director. And this is the totally chill guide to work and life. So for the past eight years, I've been working behind the scenes on all of the content you see here on YouTube and elsewhere on TFD's channels. And I also wrote our second book, Beyond Getting By, which is coming out this April. Throughout this series, I'm going to dive into some of the topics I go into even more in depth in the book, all about how to approach your work and your money from a totally chill place, where they help you live the life you want without ever becoming your sole focus. Building long-term wealth is still a pipe dream for many. Automated platforms like Betterment make it easy to start investing no matter what tax bracket you're in. Betterment is the investing and savings app that puts your money to work and your mind at ease. With their expert-built ETF portfolios, you are automatically diversified across thousands of stocks and bonds at once. Your money can multitask in the background while you do literally anything else. Plus, their automated investing tech and tax smart tools are designed to help maximize returns so you can feel secure knowing your money is putting in the work. Get started, be invested. Go to betterment.com TFD or click the link in this video's description to sign up in minutes. Your future self will thank you. Before the advent of the digital age as we've seen it, but after the first major impacts of the Industrial Revolution, there was a general prediction. By this time in human history, we would all be working less. But clearly that has not happened. We are overworked and burnt out. According to 2021 data from the American Psychological Association, nearly three in five employees reported negative impacts of work-related stress, including lack of interest, motivation, or energy, and lack of effort at work. Meanwhile, 36% reported cognitive weariness, 32% reported emotional exhaustion, and an astounding 44% reported physical fatigue, a 38% increase since 2019. And Hessel Culture has told us that working more is going to lead to more money and more fulfillment. But research shows us the opposite. Working more means we're more burnt out and less happy, and only a fraction of people at the top are getting outsized compensation, which is very evident when we look at the rise in CEO compensation in the last several decades. In 2022, CEOs were paid 344 times as much as the typical worker in contrast to 1965, when they were paid 21 times as much as a typical worker. To illustrate just how distorted CEO pay increases have gotten, in 2021, CEOs made nearly eight times as much as the top 0.1% of wage earners in the US. And looking back, it was inevitable that our collective burnout brought about by hustle culture would lead to the quiet quitting era. The girl boss narrative was not serving us anymore. And the rise of quiet quitting was a collective response to the realization that taking on more at work was not, in fact, the path to a more lucrative and fulfilling life and career. Unfortunately, though, quiet quitting is not really a long-term solution to burnout. For one thing, think about the expectation you already have set if you are the last to log off every night and the first to arrive the next morning, and when you're always known to go above and beyond what your job duties list. If you are that person and you try to arbitrarily put boundaries in place that didn't exist before, it's going to be perceived as you slacking off, and that could lead to a negative performance review or worse. It's much easier to put expectations in place from the beginning rather than retroactively try to set boundaries in a workplace that just didn't have them for you. And if quiet quitting is coming about because you're just not that interested or engaged in your job, we have to remember that burnout is not cured by finding a dream job. Aside from societal policy level changes to our workplace culture, on a personal level, the best thing we can do for burnout is to take an interest in our own lives outside of work. For the book, I interviewed Eve Rodsky about her concept of unicorn spaces, which she also has a great book about. Unicorn spaces are values-based pursuits, which are activities that A, spark your curiosity, B, involve connection, meaning they aren't solo activities, since friendships and social engagement are so key to our happiness, and C, have an element of completion, so you're more motivated to keep going. And your own anti-burnout outlet or unicorn space could be any number of things. One of Eve's favorite examples was a woman living in Queens who decided to take place in a polar bear plunge, where she participated in a group diving into the freezing cold Atlantic Ocean every weekend, um, which could not be me. But my personal anti-burnout outlets for the past year have been doing yoga classes with friends, as well as starting indoor rock climbing. On the other side, my husband, while he also does rock climbing, has for the past year been participating in a weekly Dungeons and Dragons campaign. So these can really run the gamut. But while anyone can theoretically make more space for these activities in their life, and as Eve would argue, it shouldn't be optional and is crucial for your well-being, the truth is that you need time and energy to be able to pursue them in the first place. And if you have been consuming content from TFD for the past few years, you have likely heard that we have taken on a four-day work week. The four-day work week right now is incredibly buzzy, and Chelsea herself has been interviewed a number of times about it at this point. But there have been real-life trials outside of our own that have shown that this is a good thing to put into practice even from a company perspective. Between 2015 and 2019, Iceland conducted the world's largest pilot of a 35 to 36 hour work week cut down from the traditional 40 hours without any calls for a commensurate cut in pay. 
some 2,500 people took part in the test phase. To ensure quality control, the results were analyzed by British Think Tank Autonomy and the Icelandic nonprofit Association for Sustainability and Democracy. The pilot was dubbed a success by researchers, and Icelandic trade unions negotiated a reduction in working hours. Speaking as an employee of TFD, it has immensely impacted my life. I still occasionally have to do some work outside of my regular hours, even on Fridays when we're not technically working, but not having the expectation to be online that day makes my whole work life more flexible, and I'm always able to make up for time off when needed. I think the most noticeable impact of the four-day work week is that everyone at the company respects it equally, or at least I hope that's the case for everybody else. We have a culture of valuing each other's time because no one wants to work more. We do fewer meetings than we used to four years ago, and we're ultimately just more mindful of how we structure our work days. But the real question here for someone who doesn't work for a CEO who herself wanted a four-day work week is, how do you get an employer on board? None of us needs to be sold on the idea of working less, but companies do. You have to meet them where they are. They don't care about your happiness. But you know what they do care about? Dedicated employees and low turnover, aka lower costs. In the book, Chelsea actually wrote our chapter on the four-day work week. And here is what I think is one of the most important takeaways. The most important thing to understand when advocating for a four-day work week, especially to old school executives who are often as resistant to change as they are to the concept that they could be wrong, is that it works. In most white collar jobs, the actual amount of necessary work that gets done in an average 40 hour week takes far less time than those 40 hours. Most of us are already engaging in redundant tasks or involved in projects for which we are not necessary or spending time just staring at our screens in an approximation of thoughtfulness. The key is demonstrating that we don't need as much time as we think we do and that switching to a more streamlined way of working reduces the mental load on employees, increases their creativity and ability to produce, and skyrockets their retention. Executives may not listen to arguments about their humanity or the glittering potential of their lives outside of work, but they will listen to increased profit margins or reduce turnover, both of which the four-day work week has strong arguments for. So come up with a plan or presentation that appeals to them from a business perspective, not a personal one. And the book does have a template for this kind of presentation, but you can also just use these guidelines to make one for yourself. So first you'll want to answer, how can this affect the company's bottom line? And the answer is productivity often increases with these kinds of schedules. In Japan, Microsoft tested a four day, 32 hour work week and found that although workers were on the clock 20% less than before, productivity jumped by 40%. You'll also want to share some real life examples of the four day work week working out. You can point to real life case studies that I've already discussed or even use TFD as an example. We'll link to a list of companies that have adopted the four day work week in the description, but this is always changing. So definitely do your own research and definitely use examples from your own industry where possible and find an opportunity to present your plan for maximizing productivity with minimal working hours. You can read all about the new systems we put into place at TFD in the link in our description where we shared it on LinkedIn. And of course, a lot of companies are going to be resistant to the idea of the four-day work week, but change is possible. And having a four-day work week is not the only indicator of having good work-life balance. My husband works in tech, for instance, but works for an older institution rather than one of the many startups his peers work for. And he has better work-life balance than I think almost anybody in that industry. He has very clear working hours that end at 5 p.m. They often do things like summer Fridays. He has really good PTO, really good healthcare, and just a lot of other benefits that make it the kind of place that people will want to work at long-term. So if your employer is definitely resistant to the idea of a four-day work week, there are plenty of other benefits that might be easier to advocate for. Things like childcare stipends, flexible work hours, optional remote work, increased paid time off or more paid time off based on performance metrics, tuition or certification reimbursement, or personal development stipends. And as with everything we discuss on this channel, the most meaningful big picture changes when it comes to work-life balance are not going to happen from a few of us successfully arguing for a four-day work week. They are going to happen from changes at the policy level. People in Denmark do not have five weeks of paid vacation because they all have nice bosses. They have it because it's the law but we all have to start somewhere. And if you're in a position to start advocating for this, there's no reason not to. And keep at it. I have a friend who was once able to influence the implementation of a paternity leave policy at his former employer simply because he didn't shut up about it. The squeaky wheel and all that. And just remember, when advocating for better work-life policies in your workplace, you need to keep your presentation as business-oriented as possible. And of course, the better employee you are, the more pull you're going to have, especially the higher up you are as well and definitely get other employees on your side before advocating for these changes. The more organized you can be and the more you can preemptively answer the questions that your higher ups are gonna have for you, the better. And hopefully you'll be able to influence some positive changes in your own workplace that can help contribute to a larger shift in workplace culture. We decided to make this series to make some of the lessons from the book even more digestible. Each of these episodes touches on a different system that you can put into place that could hopefully improve other areas of your life. 
Do I consider myself a totally chill person? Absolutely not. I am a Capricorn who otherwise has mostly fire in her chart. I am an Enneagram one, as well as just a general type A. You've seen some of my spreadsheets from these videos, but I think having the right systems in place can help any of us have a more relaxed attitude towards work, money, and other things that often cause us stress, especially once you start to see money for what it is, a tool for helping you live the life you want to live without itself being an end goal. I do hope you'll pre-order the book Beyond Getting By in the link below. And remember that we are currently offering society members who've pre-ordered an exclusive bonus chapter. Remember that there are plenty of ways society should be changed in order to make all of our financial lives less stressful. But in order to make the right changes in your own life, you have to start somewhere. Thank you so much for watching. And even though I'm gonna head back behind the camera after this, I will see you around here at TFD.